we've seen in our first installment in, um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that Paul talks a lot about suffering and God's provision, God's comfort in our suffering, in our trials, in our challenges. Uh, we, we mentioned a lot about the fact that Paul says he has rescued us in the past. He rescues us now and he will continue to rescue us from every challenge we will face. Amen? Talks a lot about God's comforts, that God will be with us, especially when things are tough. Now, let me just uh, give you a heads up. The reason why Paul talks so much about God's comfort in troubling times is because we will face troubling times. We will see some challenges, and that will not just be in the season. It will come and go through your life. There will always be some things that you will be challenged about. But God rescues you from all of them. And then, but then Paul talks to them about why his visit was delayed. He display, explains a few things. He says, listen, I'm not just changing plans. I'm just going as God directs me, basically, is what he's saying. And then the second thing he, he talks to them about, or the last thing that he ends off chapter 1 with, um, leading into chapter 2, he talks to them about forgiveness. He says, now I know that some of you have been, he knows that, that some of those in, in, in Corinth has actually spoken against Paul. And because of that, people have stood up against them. So there's, there's arguments and there's actually a lot of people that is, that is angry because of how people in Corinth treated Paul. And Paul said, what the things that they said about Paul's ministry. Now Paul encourages them to forgive he says, listen, if there's anything to forgive, I forgive, so you forgive. Don't hold things against people. He says, it's been tough enough for everybody already. That's basically what Paul was saying. You can go read that for yourself. But I want to pick this up in verse 12, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. And Paul says this. He says, now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and I went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Right? Now let me just read this verse to you again in verse 14. That is the core of what Paul is sharing here. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. See, Paul spoke about his challenge. Paul spoke about being challenged even unto death. They were afraid they were not going to make it in chapter 1. Paul spoke about God rescuing. Here Paul steps into our triumph. Here Paul steps into the fact that God is not only a rescuer, but that we are always part of his triumph. And the way Paul puts it here, he says, I thank God that Christ leads us in his triumphant or triumphal possession, and through us spread the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ. Now, just so that we understand this, what Paul is trying, or Paul is depicting to us, the picture that he's showing us, is a picture of a Roman victor, a Roman general, that will come back after a victory that he gained, and he would lead a victory procession, a triumphant procession. And this victory or this procession would have a few elements. Now I've got to just paint you the picture so that you see what Paul is talking about here. Now a triumphant procession 
would be the ruler, the general would be riding on a chariot drawn by four horses. And he would be clothed with a purple toga and a tunic. And he would, his, his face would be, would be uh, made a little bit red, tinted red, so that there would be a reference to the god Jupiter, so that that would depict his victory, almost his godlikeness. And while he's on this chariot, he will be carrying a scepter, and on the scepter, it would be crowned by an eagle. And this general would lead this triumphant procession, and as he comes in, music would be playing, and behind him, there would be a great procession. Now, I'm going to explain this to you by quoting Apian's description. Now, don't worry if you don't know who Apian is. You can Google that afterward. But he described uh, General Pompey's victory, his third victory in 61 before Christ. Now, this is what he said. I'm going to read it to you so that you can get this picture in fully. It says, in the triumphal procession were two horse carriages and litters laden with gold and ornaments of various kinds. Also the son of Histaspes, the throne and scepter of Mithridates, Jupiter himself and his image eight cubits high made of solid gold and 75,100,000 drachmas of silver coin, also an infinite number of wagons carrying arms, the beats of ships and a multitude of captives and pirates. Now listen to this. None of them bound, but all arrayed in their native Costumes. Can you imagine what that procession must be like? This general coming in on this, on this chariot, four horses dragging these two chariots, and behind him everyone that he conquered, those that survived, those in authority, the satraps, the leaders, Countless numbers and numbers of wagons carrying portions of the ships that they sunk. Carrying evidence of his victory. Why? To explain and to, to paint a picture of the victory that was gained to those in Rome. So that they can get a bit of an idea what this battle was like and how wonderful this victory was like. Now after this, Apian actually provides a long list of various kings and satraps and generals that was led by this procession. So up behind the chariots were they, the kings and the satraps, the possessions. And to this, the pagan priests would burn incense and musicians and they would, they would play instruments so that people would know the might and the glory of this victory. But the, the, this incense that would be burned by these pagan priests that are now journeying at the back end of this procession to proclaim Pompey's victory, this fragrance would rest on the people. The people would smell this fragrance, and they've come to realize that this was actually the fragrance of victory. So every time a victory procession would come through, they would smell that. And even after this procession would be through and they would be through the crowd, the crowd would be there. People would be trying to peek and to see what's happening, but the incense, the fragrance would still remain. Yes? Now think about this great procession. This is what Paul wants us to see. But it's interesting how Paul sees himself in this procession. It's very interesting to see where Paul sees himself in Christ's victory. He says Christ is leading us in the same kind of procession. Jesus Christ gained the victory. Over every kingdom, over every principality, and every authority, there is no general above our general. There is no victory greater than the one that he achieved. 
And there is and will never be a greater victory procession than the one led through the ages by the Son of the living God, Jesus Christ, the King of glory. And I'm, and I'm seeing this, this victory procession that, that Paul is talking about, and I'm, and I'm thinking of myself, and I'm thinking even where Paul refers to this in Colossians. He says he's leading, Christ is leading this procession, and he's leading those, the, the, the enemy that he defeated, he's leading them along. And, and, and I get a bit of a picture about where the enemy is at. They are the ones that was defeated, and, and, and we are victors. Isn't it? You know, you know we with Christ. I picture myself as, as maybe, you know, us as his, his people. I'm, I'm picturing us as those that are part of the victory. We, we're standing with him maybe on the wagon and we're proclaiming with him the victory is his. But that's not the picture Paul gives. Paul writes this. He says, but thanks be to God who always leads us. Can you put that up for me again? Verse 14. Can you read this with me? Thanks be to God who always leads us as... Okay, I'm going to read that again. Thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphant or triumphal possessions or procession. You see, Paul viewed himself not on the chariot with Christ. Paul is very clear that there's only one on the chariot. Paul is very clear that the victory belongs to Jesus and Jesus alone. In Christ and in Christ alone. Paul says, I want you to see, now please don't think I'm saying that we are, don't have victory with Christ. But this passage, Paul is explaining to us that him, Paul, says, I am being led as a captive in Christ's triumphant, uh, uh, triumphant procession. You see, Paul says, listen, he conquered me. Jesus conquered my life. Saul of Tarshish that was persecuting people, killing Christians, getting letters from the high priest to go and to find more Christians to persecute and to kill. He said, on the road to Damascus, he conquered me. And Saul of Tarshish became Paul, being led in Christ's victory procession. Paul is explaining to us that when he follows Christ, he does so as a slave of Christ. That was Paul's favorite way of explaining who he is. A slave of Christ. Paul is explaining to us in this picture, he is evidence that God can defeat and God can, can, can uh, uh, um, renew and, and, and have victory and conquer even those that persecute the gospel and make them to be part of the fragrance. Amen. See, Paul sees himself as a bond servant of Christ. It's so beautiful when, he see, when, when, when it's described in Pompey's victory, he says none of them were bound. But they still led. They didn't step out of line because they knew they were conquered by the one on the chariot. I don't know about you, but I know Paul says my life was a life where I fought my own battles where I did my own thing, where I pursued my own purpose until Christ conquered me. And when Christ conquered me, I'm not walking this way any longer. I am being led by the position and the direction and the guidance and the end destination of the chariot. 
That's the picture Paul is painting here. Paul is saying as he's being led in obedience to Christ and in surrender to Christ, people look at him and they see a conquered life. They see a life that was conquered by the love and the grace and the mercy of Christ. See, you may think about it this way. As the enemy of God's people, God conquered Paul and made him not only a friend, but a brother. As an enemy of God's people, God conquered him, conquered his heart and not just turned him from enemy to not being an enemy, but he made him a father in the faith. See, over and over we see that Paul actually paints this picture. If you say, Piet, wait a minute. This sounds a little bit, that's not where I want to be in the procession. Let me read you or just quote to you Paul's passage. Just a few weeks on, we will be speaking on this in chapter 4, verse 8 to 12. It says this, we are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. We were perplexed but not driven to despair. We are persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. In chapter 6, verse 9, he says, As unknown, yet well known as dying, and behold, we live as punished and yet not killed. Why? Because in this procession, procession, it talks about life and victory, but it talks about death to oneself. It talks about the end of this and the beginning of this is in the death we die to our own purpose, our own plans, and our own selfish ambition. The victory is led by Christ and in Christ. And Paul is saying there's always two things at work. It is for life that we are dying. Let me put it in Jesus' words. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and Take up his cross and follow me. Guess what happens to those being led captive in a triumphal procession? Guess what happens when they reach their destination? Either all of them or a portion of them were killed as a celebration of the victory. Death is at the end of the procession. You guys are saying, Peter, oh my goodness. What are you preaching this morning? I'm sharing with you the way Paul sees his life. Elsewhere, Paul says, it is better for me that I go and be with him. Elsewhere, he says, I desire that, that, the, 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 that the temporary be clothed with the eternal. He's basically saying, for me, it's better to be with him than here. He says, but for your sake, I'm still here. We live lives as if we are trying to hold on to life every day. We live lives as if this is it. Brothers and sisters, in Christ's victory, death has no sting. The grave has no hold. And if we lose our grip on the reality of kingdom triumph and the triumph of Jesus Christ, then I would I would share with you, Paul actually says, then we are to be pitied. But if you know, it starts with death on the cross where Jesus Christ gave his life so that you can live. And it starts for you when you lay down your own life. In other words, dying to oneself so that we can live for Christ. Then and only then, the enemy has no more weapons. Hello? 
then and only then we understand that our pursuit is not for comfort or temporary pleasure, even temporary life. If Christ's journey with us leads us to a place and a purpose of dying, then we do so gladly for the King of kings and the Lord of all. We read the Bible. Yes, we do read the Bible, yes? Yeah. Can I get an amen at least for that one? I know the rest is difficult. We read the Bible. Amen. We read about those that died bringing the gospel to you and me. Yeah. Still we find ourselves battling Teeth and nails to hold on to things that cannot be hold, held on to. Brothers and sisters, our days are numbered. I'll say that again. Your days are numbered. There is a day when you were born and a day that you will die. What you do at the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ and the blood of the Lamb, that will matter. Eternally. In whose victory procession are you? In whose victory procession are we? Am I riding on my own chariot? Dragging along those I've defeated? Those I've hurt? Those I've conquered with my, with my wisdom and my insight? Look, I've shown him, I've shown her. Or am I being led? as a captive in the procession, the only procession that will ever matter. The victory is not mine because of me. It is his and only his and mine because of death and life in him. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul says if we understand that, then day by day we will die for those around us. We will die for our wives. We will die for our husbands. We will die for our children. We will die for our enemies. We will die for the lost. We will die for our comfort. We will lay down everything we hold up to to bring the victory and the fragrance to the one on the chariot. It is his victory. It is his victory. Long before any ministry opportunity, there was only one moment that mattered in my life. It's when he conquered me. The day when God said, hey, you, where are you going? What are you pursuing? Put down your life. Come join my procession. That's the only thing that will ever matter. It will ever be of any significance. Is what you do. With what and how he loves and calls you. But you will not be able to follow in his procession while holding on to your own life. Jesus is very clear about this. My time is running out, but I have to leave this with you. Listen to this. Verse 15, for we are God's pleasing, pleasing aroma. Do you say that with me? We are a pleasing aroma. We are a fragrant offering. Well, pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Think about it. The enemy that stood against the one on the chariot, what does the fragrance of this procession smell to them like? They know the victory is there. Death is at the end of this procession. Yes? Yes? And those standing along the road, 
welcoming the procession, glorying and praising the one that gained the victory. What does that aroma smell like? Victory. Life. Paul says, listen to this. He says, we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma that brings death. To the, to, to the other, an aroma that brings life. When your own fragrance and the fragrance of your own purpose, when that fragrance is laid to bed, when that fragrance dies with the old you, and a new creation according to the Romans and Christ Jesus saying, listen, you've got to be born again, this new creation. If we live in Christ Jesus, then the fragrance of Christ permeates everything within us. And I want to share this picture with you. Have you ever driven, uh, you, you've been on the road and your windows are open and you just enjoy the open road and you stop behind somebody that is smoking in a car in front of you? If you ever had that experience? Fragrance, smell, is intrusive. Isn't it? It goes even where you don't want it to go. Come on. You with me? Smells go where you don't want it to go. Bad odors go where you don't want it to go. Yes? Yep. I had a very good friend of mine that said, you know, um, talking about the truth of Christ without the love is like kissing somebody with bad breath. He said the kiss might be good, but nobody's coming for seconds. <laughs> Odors remain, yes? Now let me share this with you. Do you think there's any better fragrance than the fragrance of Christ? No way. Do you think there's any better fragrance than the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that just permeates and oozes from a life that died to itself and is living for Him? Let me share this with you. Even those that don't want to smell it will smell it. Even when you just pass by for moments and you move on, those that remain will say, the fragrance is still here. Paul says, I am being led as a captive in Christ's procession. This isn't through us. He spreads his aroma everywhere to those that are being saved and to those that are still unsaved. Our job is not to determine who's saved and who's not. We have two roles, and I end with this in Paul's teaching here. Number one is to understand that the procession is not ours, it is His. And we are being led by Him. Number two, our role is to spread this fragrance of Christ to everyone, not just those that want it, to everyone. I'm going to ask Lisa to come forward. And I want to remind you that this aroma that we're spreading is an aroma of Christ. It's an aroma that will never be faulted. It will never go away. It will never lose its power. It will never stop spreading 
the message of Paul's grace and his love. Paul asks, lastly in this little portion, he says, and who is equal to such a task? It's a good question, isn't it? Lord, if the only thing that you're asking of me is to die to myself so that I can live for you, it's wonderful, but I see myself, I see how many times I fail, I see how many times I pursue my own triumphs. So with Paul, I want to ask, Piet feels the same. Who is equal to such a task? Who is equal? To be honest, in our own strength, it is impossible. It is impossible to die to yourself in your own strength. But in Christ, all things are possible. Follow Him. Hold on to Him. Let us spread this fragrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've got to understand that it's not just life now and death one day. We are living a life which includes dying every day. It's very important that we understand to live is to understand our weakness, our suffering, and our death in Him is the means by which Christ spreads His fragrance. Now this sermon is done, but I just feel in my heart I'm going to give you one more example. If in any argument, in any conflict, you hold on to your own conviction so tight that you lose the love and the grace. You might win the argument but the fragrance will not be His. If in our husbands and wives if we always just go with who thinks is right I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because I know I sit with most of you every now and again. Husband and wives, how much do they love one another? And still, on both sides, the wife believes, I'm right. Husband, I'm right. Do you know what? There's only one that's right. There's only one that's the truth. That's Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus never, never just left people because they were wrong. He stepped into their lives and He spread His fragrance of truth, of grace, and of peace. And He changed their lives through that. Let's spread His aroma. Ask yourself, wherever you go, what fragrance do you leave? Let us pray.